Okay, perfect. So great, Jim. Good to see you. And I see your I see your plaque back there too. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this, now I can see that. Okay. Yeah. Well actually I've got two of them. Uh it's not a plaque. Uh, this one is uh, for the spring of 1994 when Dave Hughes and Ron Brown were down here at the Badger Fly Fishers. And I donated that. I, I used to do a lot of framing for the club. And mm -hmm. uh, so I donated that to the club. And uh, this older retired couple out of the Quad Cities had bought that. And with the deal with, that they were going to come up and have me guide them in the spring, and then they were going to go out to Montana and fish with Ron Brown out in the Missouri River. Well, anyhow, they, they came here. And uh, the funny thing was, I had gone out the night before, and there used to be a bed and breakfast that I was affiliated with years ago. And they were staying there as well. It was part of the package that we had donated. And uh, so anyhow, I asked him, I said, well, okay, who wants to catch the first fish? And of <laughs> course, uh, my husband says, well, go ahead. I'll always catch a fish. Well, I, I had spotted this rainbow trout that was probably a little over 16 inches and in just, you know, it was in Castle Rock Creek, just clear as a bell. And uh, took her down there and uh, she did three casts and that fish ate the fly. Well, I'll tell you what, they, they ended up spending two days fishing with us and uh, he never did catch a fish that big. So he was a little <laughs> upset. <laughs> so when he went out and, and fished with Ron Brown, uh, and Ron was my mentor. Uh, he was a fly tying consultant for Bailey's Fly Shop years ago oh, yeah. and actually tied the uh, bunion bug for River Runs Through It. So anyhow, that's my ties with his past and my past. But anyhow, uh, he got out to Montana and he told Ron Brown, he says, I'm going to give you $100 if you can get me into a bigger fish than what she caught in Wisconsin. Well, <laughs> Ron did get, he earned his $100, but he said he spent two days doing it. <laughs> but anyhow... Yeah, and the other one is uh, when I came up with uh, Chris Young and we did the one fly competition. Oh, yeah. The first year. And I was proud to be part of the Lee Wolf team. And anyhow, I decided with, you know, being the initial thing, what I would do is take a poster around and every participant in that one fly tournament for the first year, I had signed that. And it's so it's a one of a kind, and it's kind of kind of nice to have on the wall. And someday, geez, I just may forward that to somebody. That's great. Well, let me say hello to a few people out there. Hello, Al, Jerry, Jack, Bob, Jim, Joe, Cal, Gal, John, and Bob and Juski. I saw you a minute ago. Hi, Mike. I bought Rob, Larry Marsh, Ed Dahmer. Hey, uh, I need to see some faces here. Open up your videos if you can, guys. It's so much more fun when we do yeah, that. I and I there wish. we go. Now I know who I'm talking to. Hi, Jerry. Oh, you're a parking lot. There we go. <laughs> That's better. Hello, Peter. Hello, Chris. Hello, Hello everybody. Hello, everybody. Just say hello to everybody, please. I, I'll shut up for a while. Say hello to people you want to talk to. Okay. Well, you know, I thought tonight what I'd do is just more uh, present a, a question and answer thing. I know a lot of yeah. you folks have been up to the area over the years, and everybody goes to the same old, same old. You know, I, I want to fish the blue. I want to fish the green. I want to fish Castle Rock. And in reality, uh, you know, we've got uh, over 40 trout streams that nobody goes to. And, and the tough part about this part of the state, and if you took the county and dissected it by the ridges, you've got Highway 18 that runs east and west, 
in Highway 61 that runs north and south. And they all bear their own watersheds. Uh, the, I, and I would say the shortest one is the Big Green River because you've got that little area between Highway 18 and the Mississippi River. Uh, in that you've got Crooked Creek, uh, Millville, uh, and of course the Big Green River. And Jim, Jim let me stop you there because we want you to do this, but I'll, we're going to have a little bit of BS back and forth. I was just telling everybody to say hello to each other first, and then okay. we're going to do a, uh, that to about seven. Have a short business meeting, and then they're going to while everybody gets on here. We're going to do a, um, your question and answer, but oh, okay. I appreciate it because yeah, these guys will sit there and look at me all night if I don't start talking. So <laughs> they say, say hello to each other, you know. Okay. And some friends they know each other out there, and uh, I know, I know somebody else is out there. Hello, Joe Schultz, and I wanted to know if uh, I saw John here earlier. Is that what John is that on there for me? He's gone. I don't see him now. John's muted. He's on the bottom. <laughs> Somebody got him. Oh, there, there we go. go. Hi. Hey, how are you, John? I'm Mike Strockel's friend. Pardon me? I'm Mike Strockel's friend. You know Mike Strockel? Oh, okay. Great. Right. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Great. Welcome, John. Nice to have you. I thought it was John Somas, and uh, I'm always having a good time with John on uh, getting hooked up to a Zoom meeting. He never he never can get this thing right until we walk through it a couple of times, and then he does, and he gets in there. And is that Brent and Mark? Hey. Hi, Mark. Hey, Jerry. Hi there. How you doing, Jerry? How you guys oh, doing? Good, Brent, you there? I am. Hello, gentlemen. And ladies, say hello to the folks. And Kurt, Kurt, I'm yeah. so glad you're on here. Say hello. Hi, everybody. We haven't seen your face for a long time. I know. Yeah. I know. I'm surprised I'm not breaking somebody's computer. Well, hit your Did video. You <laughs> Did you shave today or not? Let's see. Uh, I did this morning. Yeah. I haven't had, Jerry, I haven't had a beard for you two years. You can turn the uh, video on then, Kurt. Oh, duh. Yeah. Uh, Kurt, for everybody that doesn't, not familiar with it, there's Kurt. Kurt's the gentleman that writes Grumpy's page. Ooh, gentlemen. Uh, oh, right. Gentlemen. <laughs> I think what we ought to do is compile all of those in a, in a book form and uh, sell them to raise money for the chapter. <laughs> I know you I, don't want to do that, but uh, that would be a that would be a project. It there, would. There's, there's well, we've been, I've been problem. doing it for what I don't know, twelve years. As long as I can remember, yeah, fifteen years or something like that. Yeah, you guys may not know it, but pretty soon I'm just going to start over. Yeah, <laughs> and nobody will notice. <laughs> just nobody change the names. <laughs> just yeah, change the names. You know, and, and all the character and all the characters in this, many more in this uh, thing yes. refer to people in the chapter. And so you kind of have to be in to know who these are referring to. Sometimes, like. yeah, sometimes that's true. Yeah, troublemakers. Yeah. Most of them. You hear that, Mark? He's talking about you. <laughs> yeah, I resemble that. It's all in fun, though. Nothing personal. Good. Hey, Jerry, Nobody... I noticed that a lot of people don't have their pictures up there. Mine isn't yeah. up there today, and I can't figure out why not. Yeah. Turn your video on. Bottom left. Video on, video. Or is something I got to do on this lower, particular. Lower left hand corner, everybody. Okay. Start video. Okay. Start video. It says the camera and the slash. There we go. We're Jerry, to see some this, the Trout yeah. Unlimited does have a dinner meeting, right? used to so that if i eat now it's okay with you guys oh yeah <laughs> yeah Just, i have some leftover chill i i have to get rid of before ann gets home tomorrow. what are you drinking bob <laughs> that's the 
Which the active speaker? I'm drinking line and kugel canoe paddler. Oh, mm. okay. Oh. I was going to have what I thought was a Pelosi, but it turned out to be a Potosi. So I just... <laughs> 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 I misread it. <laughs> I I'm eating pizza. Go pretending I'm at the meeting. <laughs> Blood orange and bourbon tonight. That's his. Oh. I'll try to keep Stover long enough to get uh, Jim talking, and then we'll be all right. There's Why, Jonathan. The rest hey, of us won't be. <clears throat> Duke snuck in here. How are you, buddy? Hello, Bob. Duke. We can see you. Duke is here. Thanks, Val. Good to see you. Good to see you. I expect that the next three or four I need stages. to see Do Larry Marsh and Joe Schultz and Dick Butel. If they'd turn their cameras on, that'd be nice. And, uh, I know Brent doesn't turn his camera on. He's broken. There's Mark. How are you? Thanks, I'm Mark. dialing in. <laughs> my phone too. Tell, tell Mark to turn the camera off. It's hurting my eyes. <laughs> All these people. How do you make it so small? Or can't you? Well, hi, Chris. You know, we don't have to take a vote, but Joe has the best background. Oh. Uh. Joe's got it. Yeah, he's got. It. Oh yeah, he had that other one before. That was the best. The parking lot. I like that, Joe. Yeah. Parking lot's been replaced by a building, so that's used to be my view out my office when I went to Chicago. Now I work at home. But oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. All right. Okay. I've got I've got uh, new lights here under my desk. Uh, I have to put a hat on tonight to keep the bald head from shining too brightly here for you. We didn't want to blind you. Just use a dimmer light. Play around for another page, right? Social light. What do we got? Okay, I've got more people coming on. Spread out all over the place. Hey, there's Bob. There's Mr. Becker. All right. Who else is out there? Let's see. So Chris. There's Mark. Hey, Jeff. Hey, Mark. <laughs> Jerry, if you look real close in the background of my, or in the picture of my background, you see Bernie Sanders sitting there in a chair with his mitt. <laughs> <laughs> what stream is that, Joe? Hello, John. Um, Mr. Bob? I don't honestly know. I grabbed it off the uh, internet. It is a driftless area for sure. I forget. Oh. What it is, though. You're kind of familiar for the driftless area. That's why. I asked. How did you get to this with his link? Where did you get this link? From his email to me. An email? Yeah. Hey, Jerry, I only see, like, on my main page, I only see, like, nine people. What's that? When, when, that again, I look at, when I look at my screen, I see nine people, nine boxes. Are you on speaker it's, view? To see Chris, anybody to, else, I have to go, scroll go over. Go up to the top right and hit gallery view. Yeah, go to gallery view, Chris. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I'm looking at it on an iPad. It doesn't say gallery view at the top right. Yeah. You can probably scroll. If you uh, scroll left Chris, and right, you might on see iPad, additional. On scroll. iPad, gallery view is top left. Top yeah, left. Right. How many people top we left. have on so far? You've got to count. What's that say? Switch camera, switch the gallery view. So I switch the gallery view and it only shows nine boxes. Huh. Mm. Now the so other I'm, nine, if I scroll the whole screen to the right, then I get another nine boxes and then I, there might be more beyond that. So I don't see people, yeah, I don't see gotta, Mark, I don't see Bob. Screen. I see Jim Romberg, so I was happy to see you, Jim. How are you? How are you doing, Chris? Good. I'm good, buddy. Good Can't wait to, to come you. up there. Well. Well, life is good. Yeah, yeah, it's just it's a little it's chilly to get up there. Now. Yeah, Chris, that's what's up. <laughs> so, let's see if I might be your iPad, Chris, that that happens. If you get a uh, a regular computer, it, it shows. I'm on it. Yeah, we're trying to. I'm, yeah, I'm trying to. My wife's going to Chris, Chris, iPad. Chris, that's a setting on your iPad. The enter full screen. Yeah, you got to go into settings on your iPad and adjust it. And, and adjust it for a Zoom or just anything? 
Um, I, I'm not sure where you'd find it at, but it's it's on your iPad, so I won't worry about it right now. Yeah, yeah no, I'm not. It's gonna make my brain hurt. As long as I can, as long as I can see a few of you guys in gym, I think I'm okay. Yeah. Now I gotta get rid of this shirt. It's getting too warm. So everybody, anybody else been out fishing lately? Nobody's been out. No, actually, um, I've been out ice fishing on our on our uh, pond. Any good? Yeah, give me a second. Out up here around Baroqua and over in Iowa, but I have a host to let you in. All right, hey Jerry, we're trying to come in on our laptop. If you can let us in. Okay. What'd you say, Duke? I missed it. Kind of. uh, around Viroqua and over in Iowa. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But, but I, 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 Iowa, set my, I set my expectations low for January and February, uh, and I didn't <laughs> 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 Is my audio on, too? I don't know. Yeah, I can hear you. Clear. You can hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. okay. Turn that off, otherwise you're gonna get echo. Echo. Right, I turn that off. I'm on an iPad and I can see all your all your faces. Oh. Yeah. oh, it says Carolyn Young. Tell them it says Carolyn. It says Carolyn Young, but it's actually me. She's much prettier. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Love you, Jim. Did you turn that on? Wow, we're picking up some echo, 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 echo. Yeah, I heard that also. So now you're getting echo. I'm trying to turn mine off. Sorry. Yeah, it's Chris. <laughs> Okay. Hmm. Hey, yeah. um, where's Will Jerry you? Ward? Jerry, Bob Schroyer has yeah. a, a, a uh, no. license, license to spray herbicides. Yep. And uh, Ray also, uh, I can't think of Ray's last name, Bob. Do you know? Eisbrenner. Eisenbrenner. Yeah. They they would be they're the guys you want to keep in touch with, okay. Ray Eisenbrenner and and Bob Schroyer, so that uh, I don't have to go through that process again. I'm tired of it. Uh, <laughs> I know the feeling. It it's, it's state test and it's all about agriculture and you have to learn things that. And it's even more complicated to now because you have to do it online. Yeah, it's now you do it online. Really squirrely. I don't know. even it's a mess. Yeah, it is. So. Well, they have that their license. We can use them over yeah. at uh, Fox Bluff. So good. We'll make sure that uh, we got we keep in contact with you guys when we're ready to do some brush cutting. Yeah, and get in. that'll work out great. You don't have anything scheduled yet, though, huh? Nothing scheduled. No, no. And probably uh, the first thing we're going to do. I don't know, Jerry. Where would Jerry go? I lost him. There he is. Uh, is uh, some brush pile burning. We've got yeah. some heavy yeah. duty brush piles to burn over there. That's that's a good uh, idea while the snow is on there. Yeah. yeah, they want us to do it when the snow is on. It's the only time we can do it with snow. Yeah. And we have to uh we have one that we have to move uh, because it's sitting on a whole bunch of white trillium. And that's not good. <clears throat> it came up through it a little bit last year, but I'm sure we suppressed a lot. And I don't like to see that happen. Uh, white trillium are pretty much scarce around this part of the country. Yeah, uh, we, we don't. You know, you just you don't see them. The deer get to them, and they're all in a uh, a very very hard to uh, to get to area for the deer, and not too easy to get to for the brush pile. And so uh, that is. Uh, the way it's the way it's at now, we're going to have a fun time getting the brush pile out of there, but uh, we got to do it. Yeah. So 
Whose ice pictures were that? Those are pretty cool. That was uh, that was me and uh, my daughter and one of her friends catching bluegills. Oh, dog caught the most. So Scott. you were out. <laughs> yeah, I was running the tip ups and uh, and uh, help you know taking the fish off the hooks and. Oh yeah. So and that's the dogs. We're all out there having fun. So. <laughs> that's what I need is a dog to point out fish to me. There you go. Ah. Oh, hey, your daughter's getting big. Hey, yeah. yeah. It's just what happened. I just got my video turned on and it's sideways. I don't know why it just turned on. How did you do that? <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> Hello, Peter. See if I can rotate it. Oh, you you you're going to fall off that screen, Peter. Be careful. Yeah, slide down. Maybe I'll just go to video settings. You know. <laughs> oh, you're getting, yeah, yeah, you're yeah. Some roller coaster stuff. Yeah, I don't know what I no. did, but okay. Maybe you just lay down. Yeah. <laughs> Rotating it. It looks good. <laughs> you know. Jim. As long as we're not sliding, that we're okay. Lay down Jerry, to the left, you'll be upside down. You guys should be careful. This is going to be a future edition of Grumpy for sure. <laughs> I'm, well, I'm recording, I'm recording this either. whole thing, and we'll I've got names on the screen. <laughs> this is not going to end well. <laughs> that's, 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 who invited that guy? I'm seeing I'm not the only one with a buffalo plaid shirt on at least. <laughs> and the title yeah. could be the uh, technological savants. Exactly. Yeah. Well, maybe not savants. Um, maybe something else. But. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Scott, have we added anybody lately? Are we pretty much? No, we're, uh, no one else is coming in. We got 29 participants. I think, okay. uh, I think we're about there. We're about there. Okay, good. Uh, the, only one I, the only one I haven't seen is Meg Gallagher. Yeah, where's Meg? She, she's usually late coming on. She'll be there at probably 7. We'll oh, okay. see Meg, I bet. Yeah, Meg might might show up. Uh, the first thing, first um, fly tying. Let me talk a little bit about fly tying. We've been doing that on Tuesday nights, and uh, things are working out pretty well. I hope nobody's complaining too much. Uh, you're getting a few new guys all the time, and you're welcome to join in. Just send me an email, you know, the SAP 375 at AOL. It's on everything uh, we have on the, the chapter, my email. So send me an email, give me your email address and I'll include you in the invitation that I send out every week. It starts at seven on Tuesday night. Uh, and just as a, uh, a note, we have some things to give away for fly tying. I have, oh, Oh, I gotta get a hard helmet. I have three bags like this of turkey marabou for making marabou leeches. All you have to do is send me an envelope, self addressed, stamped, and uh, I'll send you out some. And, and this is for making turkey leeches. You can do whatever else you want with it, too. I mean, make pillows, I don't care. Uh, that's what it looks like. like, and it's all been coming through from uh, the DNR over there in in Dodgeville. Now, to do those, Jerry, do you st strip them? Is that what you yeah. do? Yeah, okay. you strip them down the leave side the and then wrap them around the hook. Okay, leave part of the quill intact. Okay. Yeah, and put a usually on a jig hook style hook, uh, you can do it, or you can do it with a bead hook, regular, either way, and put a little bit of marabou out the back, and it works very well for the, uh, over at uh, what we have called White Pine State Park, 
here in Illinois, they stock trout there every spring and fall. Okay. And uh, that under a float seems to really be a ticket. And Do you run that with a, another, uh, you know, a balanced with the cantilever beat out the front or just regular fly? Pardon me? Do you, you run it with the uh, sort of cantilevered beat out the front called a balanced fly or? Yeah, you run yeah just I saw that. And I'm thinking that would be a great thing to wrap around or to uh, one of those around there. And uh, I'd, I'd like to try that balanced fly because I'm, I'm thinking that's a good good way to keep it under a float, keeping it level. And if it's just moving up and down a little bit, it should work very well. Because these are always going to be uh, just a little bit up, you know, underneath the float. They're going to be angled. They're we tried to on, on the, the jig heads. Jig heads work, small jig heads. Uh, I just yeah. use a black bead, Jerry. Yep, the jig heads work fine for that. And this balance fly kind of is the same principle. I've, I've seen that. Um, so uh, that Jerry, down, down yeah. in Missouri at the, in the trout parks where I grew up fishing, that's just like standard under a float on a jig head, <laughs> pop it a little bit, and let it float down and just and and we we always do them in black and yellow. That's a big. That will work. Yes. You do that in the, on, on the ice, Scott? Did you say? No, no. This is down in the down in Missouri in the trout parks where I grew up. Trout. Oh, park. oh okay. You guys ever been down there? Yeah, I I think you could work this uh, the same way with uh, bluegills. Yep. Actually, in a smaller hook, in through the ice should work. Uh, anyway, I had that and then Denny uh, Sullivan just sent me more elk hair than the body can stand. Uh, it came <laughs> in today. It's hard backing. It's not the soft stuff you get from the store, but it's some really nice elk hair. It's light and there's some dark elk hawk in there he sent along too, some short. So uh, if you'd like some Somehow you can send me a little bit bigger package out and uh, I'll send it back to you. I'm going to have to cut it up with a hacksaw, I think, but uh, we'll try to do it. it's a little hard on, the, on that. I haven't cut it up yet, but uh, there's some really nice pieces in it. Uh, I'm trying to find an Eskimo to chew on it to soften the leather up, but I haven't <laughs> seen many out lately. Uh, well, there he is. He's chewing. What's that? I said Kurt was just on there chewing. Maybe he was auditioning. Oh yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe I should talk to him. Meg just got here. Meg just Be got careful, here. Kurt, say, you know they're they're, they're bad here. Um, I, I, I use leeches a lot up here. Friend, let's see. I got to find Becker. Is he still here somewhere? Say hello, Bob. So I can find you. Becker? Right below you, Jerry. I'm here. Oh, okay. Well, that's good. because Oh, there you are, up on top. Um, you want to tell them about that idea of the chapters? Yeah, chapters? I've kind of gotten um, together with the guys at the West Denver TU chapter. And um, one of the things that came up the other day they were wondering if we would be interested in possibly doing a, like a shared chapter thing where you'd have, we'd be like sister chapters where we would share information and even invite them to meetings if they wanted to come to uh, talk about Driftless. They could learn about the Driftless area and then vice versa. Um, we could learn about, you know, fishing in Colorado, conservation efforts and things like that. What, the Colorado Department of Wildlife is doing and then share, you know, doing later on down the road, maybe doing some of the raffle things together. And um, so I just thought I'd, I called Jerry today and asked him about it. And he said, well, let's talk about it at the meeting. So we thought we'd uh, give you guys an opportunity to um, maybe mull it over and see what you think. <clears throat> Anybody? Sounds good to me. I like it. I think that's a good idea. Jerry says like thumbs it. up. Yeah. Likes it. 
The more any, the other, merrier. any other negatives? As long as you guys don't tell them about my favorite spots I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think they're going to give up their favorite spots either. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They, they will. They're in they will. Colorado. Well, that'll be interesting to, to listen into the meeting. And uh, yeah, they're continue. actually they're based out of um, Golden, Colorado. Okay, which is where the Coors factory is. So they don't have their meetings there, but um, they're close. Okay, <laughs> and they do a lot of work on Clear Creek. Yeah, they've which... been doing a, their biggest thing right now is um, they're trying to work with a lot of the the villages and towns along Clear Creek going up to um, up to Loveland ski area and then and down into where it dumps into the South Flat. And um, they're looking at, at restoration efforts and things like that. So yeah, it's a lot of cool information. We just thought it'd be pretty cool if we could share that back and forth. Um, I know I've talked to a lot of the guys on some of the calls and they always ask me what's going on in the drift list and where can we go and all that. So um, it might be interesting for both of us. Sure. Sounds good. Sounds good to me. Sounds everybody. Anybody complain about that idea? No, a good idea. Bring them on. Oh, sounds yeah. good. I think it's a good idea. We should, we should try to plan some kind of program when we're going to bring them all or bring us all together. And so it doesn't end up just uh, well, so it's a better experience for everybody, right? Yeah. Some program when we're all going to meet up. It could be really cool if we contribute something and they contribute part of the program. You, um, you guys could train them about uh, how to make styles right. There yeah. we go. <laughs> I might appreciate that. Hey, that's a good come idea. Come on. Believe me, they need them out here too. Yeah, probably do. Yeah. But I don't want to dig a style in Colorado. It's all rock. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of stone. Maybe Jim's they can make something break. That. Yeah. Hey, Meg, say hello to Jim. He was wondering what happened to you. Da -da -da. Hey, J Meg, say hello to Jim. You're not on. Say hello, Jim. Was wondering what happened to you. Hi, Jim. How are Hi, you? <laughs> there you go. There's Jim. Go there you go. There. Okay, we got that over. Uh, so, Jerry, uh, Ward, and Mark, uh, you two uh, need to set up a time uh, and decide on it uh, for burning brush piles, and then we can send out some information about them. Um, there, the information I'm getting is from Jackie Bureau that we can only have 10 people at a time, mm -hmm. and that's more than enough for brush piles. Yeah. Uh, anyway, and so... Um, if, if you establish a time and we, we set out uh, invitations of people uh, to come out and uh, we can get 10 people and we only have to say that it's going to be very tentative according to the weather um, at the, that day. You know, it'll have to be a last minute, yes, we're going or no, we're not. Well, it so looks like we'll have snow cover for at least the rest of the week into next weekend, so... Maybe the snow is one thing. The snow is a biggie, but the, 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 the actually the biggest thing is the atmospheric pressure and the wind. Because when we burn there, the smoke is going to, if it goes over to houses in, you know, if, where people live, we can't do it then. So we have to yeah. wait for that time when it's going to go straight up and dissipate and do all this. And uh, humidity has to be right, Jerry. There's about 10 different items that have to go through and you check off and then you have to alert the fire departments, the police departments, the McHenry County, the everything in the world on the thing. So that's the, the real critical thing. So all we can do is pick out about two or three. <laughs> well, Jerry, Somebody if you the, hill, the smoke will go up. There's not too many houses, you know. Oh. Close by, unless the smoke goes down. I don't. Five think miles. Five miles. Yeah, that's what you have to watch out for. So it, it will be a tentative thing. We set the date up, and then 
it's going to be a last minute yes or no. We'll have to make a call in and say, are we going or not? Um, so we'll set out a, send out a uh, announcement about the dates later and then um, give it a call in number probably, Jerry and Mark. Yeah, that's what we'll do. Yeah, that that would work so you don't show up for nothing. Okay. Um, styles, speaking of styles, someone mentioned it. We have, uh, how many, Duke, Duke, how many styles you need up there in Dutch Creek? Eight, five? He's muted. You're muted, can't yeah, hear you, Duke. Okay, uh, I think we need five on, uh, five on Dutch and we got a couple to work on on, uh, on Norwegian Hollow yet. Yeah, we got the, the gates. To, I, I, I tried to cut Matt Albright and haven't got an answer back yet. So I'll keep trying with him. And that's good. We're going to do some, uh, some of those hanging across the stream gates, keep the cattle from going through, but let fishermen go through. That's, uh, that's coming up in the springtime. And uh, Lee, uh, Elliot Donnelly uh, is interested in helping us do that. So they said they'd like a, some work day. So we'll be joining them to do that. And uh, that'll happen sometime this summer. That's about it there. Um, Bob Majeski, talk to us about the Trout in the Classroom. How are things going? Going really well. I actually talked to the teacher out at Belvedere North High School today. So the, the trout have hatched. They're all doing really well. They've all kind of shed their egg sac. She's begun having to feed them actual fish food. So they're kind of getting active and every day a little more active. She anticipates moving them from her birthing tank over to the larger tank in about maybe two weeks time. I mean, a rough estimate, she's guessing we have somewhere right now between, uh, say, 600 and 900 fish. So they're doing pretty well. They're thriving. And that'll be the next step. Move them to the larger tank where they'll start plumping up for us. So that's really about it. I mean, she's the poor lady has been, you know, she's a teacher out there. They just returned to class today, actually. So she's been having to do this herself and using it for like a remote uh, learning tool for her students. If anybody has been looking, she's been posting some of the progress on, a, on YouTube. And I think the address is like Belvedere North High School Fish Tank. And she just did post one tonight, actually. So if anyone wants to look at it later, you can see how they're squiggling around out there. So. <laughs> All doing, all doing good right now. So that's about it. And if for, for some of you that haven't seen this fish tank, it's like <coughs> a hot tub. It's not a not your regular classroom a hot tank. Tub. Yeah. Yeah. If anybody the size has of a hot tub. Let me know. I mean, I can fill you in on more detail. But but yeah, I mean, and it's also in addition to the hot tub size tank, it's attached to a hydroponic farming system. So she recycles the fish waste into her hydroponic system, which is pretty cool, and then filters it back, chills it back, down, <laughs> it back to the fish tank. So it's a pretty neat system. Uh, Jerry Ward had uh, got her nominated for uh, one of the Teacher of the Year spots through his VFW group. So it's because yeah, of actually, because of her dedication to this project. So yeah, she is the on our one. post nomination so yeah sorry she's now oh. she's now moved on to the district and uh, so in the district i got news from from them that um uh, like you and i they love her too so uh, everything looking is looking good for her right so i mean just again as a you know a little reminder in the past we've had four different uh classrooms that have been participating in this program She's the only one who wanted to take it on in the era of COVID, you know? Yeah, and I don't blame the others. I'm not criticizing them. I mean, they had legitimate reasons for not being able to get it in their class. But because she's an you know, agricultural science teacher, 
she's gotten all kinds of special permission to continue to go into the classroom. So she's been able to keep up the program. So anyway, she'll be our one source of stock and trout out at Fox Bluff this spring. So, and we're hoping to have, you know, near, nearly a thousand fish to put out there. Which will be good. We need, it. we need to get back up there and get some work done this year. So that's great. Get back into the Fox Bluff. And I have a feeling we'll find a few trees down and some work to do. And uh, we'll have to reassess. So that'll be great. But that's it. Okay. And now for the good news, we're kicking off a raffle tonight. Uh, you probably should have gotten emails already in this afternoon late and it describes what to do and where to go but I will tell you that uh, if you didn't it's the sage rod it's a four foot or four foot four four piece <laughs> nine foot five weight sage uh, for one prize the second is a fish pond gear bag with all kinds of dividers and things in it it's a really big gear bag really nice one and the third prize is a hundred dollar gift card to the Driftless Angler. So uh, the, that was donated by Bob Becker. Thank you, Bob. Uh, we have started this and I have to tell you that John Cullen <laughs> has been our, our leader on this and gotten everything to work for us. We've had several meetings, about five of us. Uh, to get this thing done, but without Jonathan, we would be uh, lost boys. Uh, yes. Thank goodness we had him. We didn't uh, know how to do this any more than nothing. And Jonathan never did it either, but he had the time and energy and researched it. And it's going to be a continuing thing. We're going to do this raffle this month, <coughs> another one next month and or um, do an auction. We've got lots and lots of prizes that are still to come. We're going to use this to raise money in lieu of our Christmas banquet and in lieu of the rod and raffle that we normally have for conservation this spring. Uh, so be aware you're going to see this a lot. We hope you participate. It's open right now. It opened up while during the meeting, in fact. And uh, if you if you got that email this afternoon, uh, <coughs> told you how to get into it. It's right there. You just click on it, open it up and click on it and you'll get in the raffle prizes and how to do it. It's fun. It's easy. And uh, it's TU uh, sponsored by TU, the site that's doing it. And they're rather good. Um, pretty easy too. There's no trouble uh, uh, losing your money on this, uh, except you won't get a prize. You just pay for it, right? No, uh, it's, it's very secure and uh, we shouldn't have a problem. We, we run a couple of tests and uh, we found it pretty easy. And uh, I liked everything that was going on. Jonathan, do you want to say anything about what's up? Well, I think you, you probably covered most of it, Jerry, but yeah, TU National kind of helped help the local chapters uh, with, with the software to run auctions and sweepstakes and raffles and things during times of COVID, right? So um, for all the chapters that can't run their banquets and their winter events, this is how we're gonna try to raise conservation funds and things. So I worked with the rest of the leadership here and we've, like Jerry said, we've run a few tests. We feel like this is a pretty secure system and um, pretty easy to use. So, um, please go ahead and take a look at the prizes out there. Look at your email. You should have that in your email box. Um, I've, I've been watching a bit tonight. There's a couple of uh, people who have entered already. One is on the call and one is not on the call. Actually, someone from Rockford who maybe, you know, maybe he doesn't join our meetings regularly, but this is getting out to a lot of people on the chapter mailing list. So this is kind of an exciting, an exciting way to raise funds for the chapter. We can, reach a lot of people and yep. uh, maybe even the mention of partnering with uh, folks in in Colorado maybe we can we can talk to them about getting into some auctions right. so yeah it's, it's a really a really cool thing for the chapter 
Yeah, I'd like to also thank Jerry Warren for being on the committee, Scott Rohn, Gordon Grun, uh, Mark Reinhardt, and where, oh, Brent, uh, Brent too. I, I keep looking for your picture, Brent, and I see that telephone. So, uh, I, thing, I appreciate Jerry, all the work that you guys have spent uh, doing and time we dug in and got this done. And from here on out, I hope it's a lot easier and um, we're going to see how it works. And you have, we have a lot of prizes to, to give out. And, One uh, other thing is all these deals, if you don't win, it's tax deductible. We are a 501c3 nonprofit. Yeah. Don't forget that. That's true. It always was, always will be. When's the winner for this? What's, what's the, that, Bob? What's the date for the drawing? The deadline is uh, the fourth. Is that right, John? I'm I'm taking a look right now at my calendar. One minute. We had to push it back a few days. Oh, did you? Okay. It's going to be. Yeah. Um, yes. So we're. Yeah. We're closing the ticket sales on the 4th, and we're going to be uh, drawing the winners um, three business days after that. Uh, so either on the 9th or 10th, we'll have winners drawn. Right. So so the information that we had in the newsletter about the drawing, we had, we had to push it back for some rules reasons. Uh, we needed three business days from the close of tickets. So we're looking at mid, mid the next week. That sounds good. Yeah. Any other questions? And also, I'd like to say, um, if you know you guys going through the site, if you have things you like or don't like, suggestions, shoot an email over, and we'll try we'll try to improve it as much as we can for the next one. We're all learning from this, so uh, uh, we're open to constructive criticism. And this first, this first one that we're doing is we're limiting it just to our chapter. Uh, but when we're going to do some others with some bigger prizes, uh, we're going to broadcast that through Facebook and we'd, we'll ask for your help too, to spread the word around. So we'll be uh, asking for cooperation, but this is a test run, so to speak, but it's real. Um, but it's our first run and, and uh, we're going to learn a little bit from this. So. We appreciate uh, anything you can do on the raffle. We always want to make some more money for the chapter and keep buying things. Uh, sending money up there to uh, Warner Creek and all the good places that Duke works has worked with over the years. And we appreciate very much what you do, Duke. And I know you quit, but I know you didn't quit. <laughs> you haven't quit with anything. anything. How many projects you thinking they're uh, they're going to have this year? Well, I, uh, ENR is going to be working on uh, Bohemian Valley with a, with two landowners there, probably doing mile of work. Uh, there's another project going to go on Timber Cooley just downstream from the golf course on the ski jump uh, that was damaged badly in the. 2016 and 2018 floods. Uh, Conway Creek is going to go this year, uh, and uh, and there and Warner Creek might go. Uh, Monroe County is also going to have uh, several projects on the Little Lacrosse, uh, which if you fish that, it's a, I you know I was just talking with the county conservationist last week, and 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 he said because it's it's like the major tributary to the lacrosse river and the best trout water that contributes to the cross river lacrosse river it's kind of like a weaster or a tainter creek are to the kickapoo major major tributaries and he's been patiently working on that for about 10 12 years uh as he signs up landowners and and it's getting to be a mosaic of unworked on and pretty darn good fishing water so uh, you know, it behooves you to check out the little across. Uh, the there there will be a we'll we'll be talking with you a little bit later about uh, some possible funding help, but uh, it's not going to be on the scale that we had last year. Last year we raised uh, five hundred thousand uh, dollars to go into uh, projects that were being done by Tudere 
and uh, Vernon County, uh, and and the DNR put another 160 or 170 thousand into into its work on Bohemian. So a lot of work got done last year. Uh, there might be a little bit less need for outside money uh, and support this year because we don't have as many projects. A lot of them that had been hanging fire for a few years came in last year and got put in. I hope you've had a chance to fish some of them. Yeah, I hope so too. Hey, Jerry. Yes. Do you remember the name of the stream that runs into Gordon that you and I walked and uh, that we that was that was a lovely piece of water. You remember? And Kittleston Creek. Right. Kittleston Creek, John? Yes, right. And you know what? It's done. Is that right? Yes, I, I got, got in. And, uh, and, and they did what we were talking about doing a little further down, but they didn't do the upper part yet. And, and you and I both liked that upper part. We certainly did. Do you have any idea how it's fishing? <clears throat> Yeah, I fished it, and it's not bad. It's good. It's a good place there. to go. Good. Yeah. I, I fished that closing day uh, last year and did quite well. There you go. Brent was in on it. And now, uh, without further ado, if there's no other questions, I'm going to ask Jim Romberg how it's fishing and uh, let him go to work. And I want you fellas to please pick his brain because he's he's got 44 45 or 50 years of fishing these creeks out here and uh, of guiding i don't know how many years of fishing them so he's got a lot of information up there just let him go uh i got a couple questions to start on. and uh i i want to know jim what's your favorite black caddis stream Black caddis, I would I would probably say parts of the blue, but better yet, the green. Yeah, uh, the big green river. Uh, and you know, and they are so sporadic. And the the funny thing is, uh, over the years I've guided, and and a lot of times you'll have the black caddis and the tan caddis hatching at the same time, and fish are real particular at that time. I mean, you can focus on one fish that's rising and try to present your tan caddis to it and complete refusal, but it'll come up just for a black caddis. I mean, uh, uh, you just have to be particular and very uh, exact about your matching, but probably the big green. Uh, and there are so many other streams, I mean, Grant County's got over 40 trout streams. Not that many people. I mean, everybody focuses on the big water. And that's where you get the crowded situations. I mean, the best part about my fishing over the years is exploring in new situations. Because you're going to go out some days and it's like every place that you go at every crossing uh, on your known rivers, you're going to see vehicles. Well, the deal is I always have options. I, uh, you know, have a plan B. I mean, we've got Bora Creek, we've got uh, the, the Grant River system. And, and that's one of the biggest watersheds that we have. And it's probably one of the least acknowledged. And that's okay, because, you know, I'm a little bit selfish. I know you were uh, one of your club members were talking about partnership you know, we've been doing a sister club with somebody in Colorado. And, and, and that's a great, you know, partnership uh, with other clubs out of state. And Colorado is a wonderful state. And if you contact UMQA Feather Merchants, as far as donations, they have been over generous over the years to the Badger Fly Fishers, uh, one of the clubs that I'm a, a member of and a founding member of. But um, I don't know. Any, any more questions? I mean, who's got another question? Please, somebody. Don't be shy. Jump up and ask. Yeah. What? A little well, plat. The, the little plat. Yes. Is, oh, it's a wonderful stream. The problem is, is access on it. 
Uh, and the Platte River, and in my mind's eye, if I was 30 years younger, I would be guiding the heck out of that for smallmouth. Uh, from all the way from Lancaster, all the way down to where, I mean, you're going through uh, Ellenboro, uh, it, and uh, so much of that is untouched as far as a resource. And, I mean, when I first started guiding, it was uh, uh, doing field work for Gapen Tackle Company out of Big Lake, Minnesota. Well, Ron Brown and I were hired and uh, we'd go out fishing every weekend on the Mississippi River. And of course, our whole research was over, you know, smallmouth and the Gapen Bat uh, Bait Walker. Uh, well, the deal was we'd get up real early in the morning and there wasn't much of a bite on at that time as far as our walleye and bass. So we'd go out and we'd fish stripers. Well, at that time, everybody was throwing uh, the double jig system and the whole system, the whole deal up there was go out and watch for the seagulls. When the seagulls were landing, you know, that the, small, or the, the stripers were schooling up the minnows and it was easy pickings. So you'd go out there and everybody would be out there with the two jig system. Well, Ron and I would go out there with streamers and a fly rod. And we, you know, we'd catch our lunch. And uh, we'd come in and, uh, to Slippery's up in Wabashaw. And that's where we were based out of all the time. And uh, Slippery used to give us a place he called the dog house. It was no bigger than a probably 55 Buick on the inside <laughs> and uh but anyhow uh, folks would ask us about how you know how we caught these fish and uh so we told them it's like you know uh we were throwing streamers with a fly rod and i said you can't do that and so you know people wanted to start taking us out taking them out and so uh, they said, well, you know, if you're going to do that, then you need to have a guided license. And so my first two years of guiding from 77 to 79 were basically focused on smallmouth and, and largemouth bass. Uh, and then from there, I went on because I lived up in South County uh, out on Dell Creek, which is a trout stream. Um, I continued on with the guiding, and I remember one of the first uh, guys that I had uh, had hired me, and he said, Jim, I want you to be very technical with my son. Don't use blase phrases or anything else. Be very technical. So anyhow, I procured, uh, you know, we fished on Dell Creek in my front yard, and then up towards South Avenue, and we did okay. And he said, well, is there any other options? And I said, well, yeah, I, I know up in Juneau County, which at that time was probably a, a 10 minute drive away. Uh, a guy from Illinois that uh, owns this country farm or, you know, house. And uh, we can go up there and do some pond fishing. Well, anyhow, there were three ponds up there. And mm -hmm. uh the guy said, well, what about the lower pond? And I said, well, no, I don't like going down there. I was down there a couple of weeks ago. And uh, there's a couple of bulls in that field with all these cows. And they're re really not friendly. And uh, he said, well, what happened? And I said, well, you know, they decided to go down there. And, uh, you know, there were three guys from Europe. You know, there was a, a Polish guy, a German guy, and a guy from Czechoslovakia. And anyhow, all of a sudden, I heard this hollering from two of them, and they come running towards me out of that lower pond. And uh, I said, well, what the heck's going on? He says, well, the bulls showed up. And I says, well, what would you do with your pole? And he says, Jim, I told you you use technical terms. These are fly rods. And I said, no, we left the pole lock behind. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I resemble that. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, nothing taken personally. And yeah, and, you know, and the deal with my guiding, I, I don't take politics to the stream. 
I don't take religion. I take fishing when I go with me. Uh, Chris has fished with me a couple of times. Uh, I, uh, Meg has fished with me several times and been in my house. I don't bring any of that to the stream. I am a fisherman. And, you know, my whole focus is, and I remember my humbling beginnings in, in fly fishing, and that was in California when I was in the Navy. Um, that, you know, and, and the weird thing was, and this was with Ron Brown, I spent the first two years traveling because of my job in the Navy, I was a tugboat pilot. I had every other weekend off. So we were going someplace fishing in Northern California. And so I spent the first few years of my time probably watching Ron Brown fish. I thought, you know, I'm going to learn more by watching him and learning him through his trial and errors than I'm going to learn through my sorrowful, you know, ambitions of being a fly fisherman. And the ironic part of it is now that I make a living watching people fishing. You know, it, it, but I share everything that I know for every situation on a stream. Uh, the, in, in up here in Grand County, we've got definitely four seasons. Uh, and, you know, you, it's very hard to be ready for any one of them because a lot of times you'll have multiple hatches. I mean, uh, winter time is real predictable. You may have some early black stones, uh, some blue winged olives, uh, and that's gonna be about it. Otherwise, everything else is low and slow. Uh, the water temperature is gonna be cold, so their metabolism is very slow, and you fish for that situation. And, I, and Jerry was talking about his leech pattern earlier, and that's one of my favorites. Uh, and if you look at any of the leeches that we have down here in Grand County, and I've never found one over an inch and a half long. Uh, when I fish them, they're very sparse and very small. And usually, uh, you know, and I'll use fluorocarbon because it'll sink and put that on a trailer and just swim it slow, let the current do its thing and just interact at a little bit of action. Otherwise it looks like a piece of debris. It needs to make it look like a living insect. Well, nothing is, uh, a fish loves nothing more than a free and easy meal. And if you make it look impressionistic, it'll work. Jim, what, what color leeches do you like? Uh, ours are all a very dark gray to a black and maybe a brown in between. Nothing light at all. I, I've never seen anything, and I wish I had my border color system thing with me right now, but I would, I would say brown to black, but very sparse and very small. Uh, it, it, the funny thing is, I mean, when I first started tying flies, and this was when I was in the Navy, um, uh, we used to go down to Creative Sports Enterprises. Uh, a gentleman that owned that, Andre Pouillons, uh, who invented the AP series of nymphs. Between him and Dave Inks, uh, I spent a lot of time down there. And, and the deal was back in that, in those days in the early 70s, was the exact match the hatch. And, and, and that's very true up here. I mean, when the blue wing olives are hatching, you need to match that wing color exactly. Otherwise, they will be refused. Uh, and that's basically true with all mayfly patterns. They, and trichos, which are a mayfly also. You need to match size and color and be exact about it because these fish get educated. I mean, it, you, can, you can see the scars in some of their lips because, I mean, oh my God, that's food. And yeah, you can fool them sometimes, but after that, they be, become very well educated. Now, on the other hand, uh, when it becomes caddis season, 
in the spring of the year. And my favorite times are April to June because they're most prominent along with crane, fly, crane flies. And you're gonna see some possible light, light Hendrickson's. And uh, the deal with the caddis fly is impressionistic. The only bad way to fish a caddis fly is to dead drift it. Because if you watch them in real life, they don't sit still. They are never still on the water. They're always moving, even when they're obvi depositing, they are on the water moving. So, you know, if you've got a sloppy cast or whatever, fish it out, twitch it. The worst thing you can have is slack in your line. And, uh, you know, it, uh, speaking about exacting patterns, I mean, uh, during the spring of the year, you're also going to have crane, crane flies. And, and the deal with crane flies is they'll come off very sporadically. You'd be in the middle of a caddis hatch, of a tan caddis hatch, and uh, all of a sudden the fish would be rising. And it's like, you put your fly over them and all of a sudden it's like, well, what the heck did they take next to it? And I carry a monocular with me, very small, fits in my pocket, but I can see, you know, if, if, and I take my time fishing, I'm never in a hurry. Why, why should I be? I will take my time and observe and see what the fish are eating. You know, why should I spend my time casting flies that aren't catching fish? So it's very important. And, and I had that experience uh, one time with the black caddis and the tan caddis on the Green River, where it's like, you know, you, you had to fish to a specific fish that was rising and you know, you match what he's eating. Uh, but, and, and the funny thing is, when they asked me to be um, part of America's Favorite Flies book, which is a, a wonderful book, the irony is in there, I, mean, I, I tie impressionistic flies. You know, you know, unlike my, you know, beginnings, and, uh, you know, I still have, boxes full of mayfly imitations. Unfortunately, down here, we don't have any trichos. We don't have any hexes. Uh, none of the big name things, but that's okay. Uh, my whole me message this evening would be with all this water that we've got, do yourself a favor and go out and explore different waters. Uh, you know, if you keep going to the same stream, you can expect the same results. And if you don't, you're going to be sorely disappointed. And the deal with me is I love because we've got so much water. And yes, it is right outside my back door. I've got nothing, you know, 10 minutes from Fenimore, I'm in the trout water. 20 minutes away from Fenimore, I'm in the water that nobody fishes, where you won't see anybody. And I love that. I mean, you just have to check the accesses. Uh, some of the resources that I use for my for my fishing, and this is one of them. I don't know if you can see it, but that names all the different trout streams in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, another one is put out is this one improved trout streams and these are all tu projects and project waters which means go fish those waters but it's a great resource as far as naming different streams and and you know where to get there otherwise you got the infamous gazetteer you know and i share this stuff with anybody that i know um the season, uh, seasons will progress and, uh, you know, now all of a sudden you're into summer. Uh, summer's interesting because everybody thinks summer is all about hoppers. Well, I'll be honest with you, one in 10 fish that I catch during that time of the year will be on a hopper. The rest of them will be on crickets, ants, and beetles. I, for some reason, they just do not, I mean, you could throw like a hippie stomper 
or something like that, or even a Whitlock, you know, you know, and you can watch it float by. And I proved this to one guy on, on the Big Green River down below the County Trunk T Bridge. There's an exceptionally long stretch right alongside the road. And I don't know if I've taken Meg there or not, but anyhow, um, this is downstream where I took you, Meg, uh, below that, that new bridge. But anyhow, uh, the guy says, I want to fish hoppers. Well, anyhow, walking in, and a lot of times I'll walk in from downstream, heading upstream, because I want to see what's available downstream, and I'll work upstream and come back down. I, I'm watching for moving fish that we may spook periodically along the way. Well, anyhow, we, I walked in with this gentleman, and he was all rigged. He had his hopper on. And we got up to the bend and I said, okay, well, there's a cattle crossing, you know, 30 yards up there. If, you, if you're you hell bent on fishing a, a, a hopper pattern, I want you to. And, you know, I said, we saw where the fish were when we walked in. So, you know, on this side of the bank and we walked in on the high bank and I said, we earmarked some of those spots. And those fish will be back there. Let's just wait a few minutes. And uh, I said, you know, we've got a, an option. We can throw caddises at them. And he said, well, there's hoppers all over there. There's uh, not caddises, but uh, crickets. And I said, you know what? I'm going to leave you for 10 minutes. I'll be back. I went back to the car. I got a wool blanket and two of my coffee cups from Quick Trip that had lids on it. So I started collecting grasshoppers. It's an easy way to collect them, just you know, drag a wool blanket across the ground, the legs get stuck on it and you can pick them up. Well, anyhow, I put about 30 of them into a coffee cup and then I started scouring the ground and picked up crickets and put those into a separate cup. Well, that guy walked that hole probably I know it's probably an 80 yard stretch that we had walked in and saw all these fish, came back and he says, I never saw a fish, nothing ever came up and fish were still, you know, and he said, as I walked, I was spooking them. And anyhow, he came back over to the other side and I said, okay, well, let's rest this for just a few minutes and I'm gonna do a little experiment for you. He said, well, what's in the coffee cups? And I told him, I said, I collected crickets and grasshoppers. And so anyhow, we're at the bend of the pool, up, you know, or at that long run. And I started taking the hoppers and throwing them in one at a time. And we watched them float. And I says, now watch the motion on these hoppers. In, you know, if you're going to imitate something with an artificial, at least imitate the motion of what you're fishing. And I says, I watched you, you're way too much action with your hopper. Slow it down, you know, and watch the natural. And I'd throw another one in. Well, anyhow, we watched all of those hoppers go run that gauntlet of where we saw all those fish. Everyone made it except for one. And he said, well, see, I told you that the hoppers would work. And I said, okay, let's start throwing in crickets started throwing in crickets. And I said, now watch the way a cricket reacts when it's on the water. It's very much like a hopper. They do a panic thing and then they, they'll drift, 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 and then kick, kick, kick. And, and, and a cricket will do the same thing. Well, anyhow, I don't think any of the crickets ran that gauntlet without getting eaten. And he said, well, do you have any cricket patterns? And I says, no, I don't use a cricket pattern. I use an oversized black caddis. And he said, really? And I said, well, yeah, my typical black caddis would be size 18, maybe a 20 at the smallest. Tie it on a size 12, 14. Match the size of the crickets because crickets are all going to be different sizes. And I says, you know, basically the ones that we threw out there were probably... 14, 16, maybe. Well, anyhow, he says, do you have any? I says, I just happened to. We tied that on and 
we started fishing and I says, remember the way that that cricket reacted <laughs> on the water. You know, panic kicks, panic kicks, dead drift. Panic kick, panic kick. And, and I said, always keep a tight line and mending. Well, he caught fish and he says, you know, maybe I'll save my hopper patterns for Montana. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, I, I've had a lifetime of experiences and a lifetime of folks that I've enjoyed fishing with. Um, and I'll tell you, my, my setup as far as equipment, uh, I use an eight and a half foot four weight rod. Uh, and it happens to be an Orvis that Orvis sent to me years ago when I was a, uh, a, an approved guide service for him. Uh, when I first met and became affiliated with them, uh, they, everybody was promoting a weight forward in the same way. Well, as I threw in, in you know, in, it was dead of winter when I was test driving this rod, um, I asked, uh, oh gosh, I'm trying to remember what his name is, but he was from Michigan. Uh, the, was promoting uh, and was the regional for, for Orvis. And I said, do you have anything with a five-weight double taper on? He says, yeah, it just happened to. And I put that on and I started casting that. And he says, oh my God, I can't believe how it turns over. And I told him, I said, you know, the deal that I've learned over the years that all lines are created equal, but all rods are not. So you have to try different equipment. I mean, yeah, I overweight it, but where I fish, there's a lot of mending involved. Thus the double taper. It, and, and if you've ever tried to mend uh, on a weight forward, you really have to put some push into it. And most often what, ha what happens then is the weight throws forward, it forces that loop, and it really juggles your fly. And all I want to do is get the slack out of it and control it. My leader is a seven and a half foot tapered to a five X. If I need to go any longer, I will add tip it to it. Uh, very rarely, unless I'm fishing uh, uh, midges or bluing dollars, will I go smaller than 5x. And even then I may go with 12 inches of 6x. My whole deal is the streams aren't long enough or wide enough or even big enough to justify anything longer than seven and a half foot for a liter. I, it's, I want to control the fly throughout the drift. And if I've got too much liter on a small body of water, that's really hard to do. I mean, we are subject to wind down here a lot. And if you've got your fly line, up, you know, and your rod up where the wind's gonna affect everything, well, you're losing control of that fly. So any other questions I can help with? I got one. Um, I'm interested for me and few people want to come up there as soon as we can but with the weather and temperatures and wind and you know nothing worse than ice and your guides on your fly rod what temperature would you suggest when we get into is it good to come up there you know 30s 40s or and, and is it worth coming up is the fishing good and would you just throw leeches or what would you do well um the deal was up here in, in myself i'm 68 years old and I've got a procedure coming up. So I haven't been out yet this season and I won't go out uh, because if I hurt myself and I hope to guide this year, uh, if I hurt myself now, even going out and playing, I'm done for the season. Uh, so I'm gonna wait a little bit longer. I prefer uh, air temperature to be 36 degrees and above just because of the factor that you're going to be, you know, I don't want to be fighting freezing guides. Uh, we got better, a lot better weather coming up. 
uh, in wife fight the you know everything that you have to deal with i just it's uh, it's fun to get out early but realistically and i look amongst us you know and I, I, we're not chicken it's spring chickens anymore <laughs> I, uh, but i would wait in my favorite season and we have two springs here uh, and you'll watch it because all of a sudden we'll get days into the 40s and we'll start uh, melting snow. Well, everything that you're seeing melting is on your southern exposure. And so you're going to get that runoff and that's very quick. You know, sometimes it may last three or four days and everybody gets excited about that. The problem is all the snow on the north exposures hasn't melted yet. So now you're going to get an extended amount of time where your streams are going to be high and dirty uh, going into April almost. Uh, April's a wonderful time because it's a real transition time and it's a lot safer. Uh, the tough part about being up here with a lot of what we have as far as streams is accessibility uh, is once you get into the end of June. Uh, once you get into the end of June, uh, these places that are not uh, pastured uh, or you know cultivated or anything else, they're pretty much in inaccessible. And unless you want to feel adventurous, you know, we lose probably sixty to seventy percent of where I would be very comfortable fishing in April by that time of the year. Mm. Jim, can you name your top 10 streams up there? Top 10 streams? I, well, I like the Green River, the Big Green. I love Castle Rock. The problem with Castle Rock is uh, I, there needs to be some work done in the watershed because it gets dirty. And when it gets dirty, it stays dirty until it just seems like the last day of the drought season. And all of a sudden, it's like somebody flipped the switch. <laughs> and it's absolutely gin clear. Is that, uh, is that the Doc Smith area? Yes. And, and most of it is attributed. And you have to remember that watershed goes all the way up to County Trunk T. If you're heading between uh, Fenimore and Boscoville, uh, and there's a golf course there on your right, that's, mm -hmm. a, that's where that watershed actually begins. Uh, the Doc Smith is very short run which runs up Blue School Road towards Highway 18. Mm -hmm. uh, and all of that, and the biggest deal with that is uh, some of the farming practices, uh, they plow within six feet of the you know, water edge. Uh, another place further downstream, they've probably got 60 horses on it. So it's... Mm -hmm. It's just a mud pack. Smith feeds in. It's a very wonderful pool. Uh, the, the problem uh, with fishing there is a lot of people will stop down where the parking lot is, uh, downstream of the Doc Smith. And they'll look there and say, oh my gosh, this is dirty. Well, do yourself a favor. Uh, go upstream of where that Doc Smith feeds in. And a lot of times it's fishable. Yeah, granted, it's a short section between where that feeds in and where Church Road is, you know, and you can probably get three people in there and, and you know, scramble about and play hopscotch or whatever. Uh, but if that section's dirty, you might as well move on. Uh, and I've had a situation where somebody came up and they said, you know, we want this fish, we wanted to fish the green. We walked down, we looked at the water, and I said, okay, uh, let's go down to the campground. Uh, some of you are familiar with the campgrounds mm -hmm. right below Castle Rock, uh, yeah. the Rockets, uh, or the little community of. The deal was that little area between that second and third bridge where the campground is, it's mostly ripples. Uh, and it's shallower water, and fish can see. 
you know, and if you absolutely have to fish there, that's where I would go. Otherwise, I venture way downstream of that third bridge downstream, which would be just below the rock. It's a little tricky getting downstream. Uh, I've taken, uh, Chris Young was down there with me uh, and with Gordon. I took uh, both of them down there. And, you know, and I've got a cute little nickname for it. It's, I call it the Baton March. Uh, if, if you walk from the road to the back of the property, it's a three quarter of an hour walk uh, and it's all fishable. And it can be hair raising. Uh, it can be some of the best fishing you'll ever see but it can be a little dicey because it's some of the places that you have to cross the stream at to get down there. Access is another thing. Uh, I, that's where I access is up a county trunk queue and there are styles and it is accessible. And, you know, just, you know, take care, be careful. You have to cross under a couple of fences and I always carry wire and fencing pliers with me just in case the fence gets knocked down. You know, and I wanna always be on good terms with the farmer. So I fixed a lot of fences that other people have just let go. But uh, the Blue River, okay, you named, uh, so I've got the Big Green, uh, Blue River, Castle Rock, Bora Creek, uh, which is down by Lancaster, uh, the upper Grant River, and, and there's several areas on that that are tributaries. Uh, there's the Day Branch. Uh, and, I mean, that's a huge section of water, but it can be challenging because uh, some of it runs through uh, very, well, they're wide and they're deep with a lot of deadfall in them but they've also got ripple areas. In those ripple areas, uh, me, I mean, a ripple is a magnet to me. I just absolutely love them. I mean, that's where, you know, and we're known for our caddises and that's where you're gonna find your caddises are in those well oxygenated areas. But I, you get below those and you know the whole food chain. If something's gonna show up for lunch, Something bigger is going to be be behind it. Jim, what what um, parts of the grant, the upper grant, or the feeders, do you like the best? Which streams, the Bora or or the Rogers, or which ones? Do well, you like? you've got you've got the area uh, off the of County Trunk K, coming out of Lancaster, which upstream from that, uh, and uh, there's a junction between Bora. In, in the Rogers branch mm -hmm. uh, and it's all public access. Uh, TU just did some work down there and I, unfortunately this, uh, last summer I wasn't able to fish, but uh, I've heard some good things about it. But the deal was, you know, a lot of these project waters and we've had a, a remarkable amount of them down here in Grand County and thank your club because I know you know, some of your funds have been participating or put in towards you know, helping the Herring and Laura Nor chapter up here with our projects. Um, but the deal with uh, those projects like that, you know, if they're really overwhelming, it's going to be three years before I'll even go in and think about fishing. The deal with them is, and, and if you take uh, a little instance uh, on the Green River uh, where I took Meg fishing and that was between the County Trunk K and the County Trunk T bridge. Uh, they did a project back there and they completely restructured the stream. I went back there after and I thought, my gosh, this is for a real park setting. But the deal was I saw absolutely no fish and I went back there throughout the year, even in the dead of winter. And I love walking the streams in the dead of winter, even if I'm not fishing. If I get near a stream or bridge, I'm gonna you know, go look at it at least. The deal is when you do that much reconstruction to a stream, 
First of all, you kill all the insects. Well, without the insects, the fish aren't going to be there to eat. So the second year, you may get insects back, but it's going to take a year for them to propagate, you know, regenerate in the next generation. So in three years' time, you may have insects coming back into those areas, which are going to hold your fish. And, and the deal is, I mean, I, I, I love the projects, but they can be so overwhelming to the fishing area that I just, I look at them, I admire them, and it'll be three years until I go back to them. Because I just, you know, through trial and error over the years, I just know it's not happening. So unless I want to just go back for a casting lesson and to see what the heck it looks like. Yeah, they, they, they still plant fish, you know, as normal up here, you know, a certain amount of, of rainbows, browns in some brooks. And, you know, I mean, that's just my opinion, but it's because based on experience, going back to project waters, But uh, another little stream that, uh, and if, I, if I'm talking about a top 10, is uh, McPherson. Nobody knows about it. It's a little bitty stream, and it's south of Lancaster, up a Highway 61, uh, up a airport road. And it's actually old project water from TU. And I mean, if you want a little challenging stream, it's got willows. I mean, it's probably no more than six feet wide at its widest, and it, where it runs into the Platte River, or the Grant River. I'm sorry, uh, and it's it's interesting. No, actually, I'm sorry. It, it does run into the to the Platte River, but it's a short run. But I mean, these are all different little streams. Uh, another one is Crooked Creek. You want a challenging little ditch to fish, that'll challenge you. I mean, because those fish are on a domino system. You spook one, everyone for the next 200 yards is on the move because someone spooked them. Uh, you're never going to find anything bigger than a size 18 blue winged olive on there. And uh, it's a challenging little stream. But, it, and, you know, everybody complains we're above Town Hall Road that used to be owned by the Mertzes, an old farm family that lived there. They, you know, allow access. Well, now somebody else owns that and it's all fenced up uh, and there's no access to it. I mean, uh, I don't know if I could scale fences that tall to get down to it, to access it to even get into the water to fish it. But that used to be a wonderful section of water. But from there, almost all the way down to Boscobel is accessible water. And the amount of fish that are in that little crooked creek, and I've been down here uh, in this area for what, almost 40 years fishing. I've never known them to plant a fish in there. Everything in there is a wild fish. For a number of years, if there were stream projects like a manure spill back years ago, uh, and the DNR needed fish, they would go in and they would take 500 fish out of there. You would never even know that those fish were missing. There were so many fish that inhabited that stream. And it's still full of those wild fish. And they're fun, but you want to challenge yourself. Uh, it's, it is a challenge because uh, you're, to get down in the stream, everything is like this. So you almost have to you know, pick a spot, go down to it, and it'll be brushed over very tough by June. So this would be the time of the year to go fish and water like that. Um, well, I don't know. Uh, those are, and, and there are other sections like I said, of Day Creek going up uh, uh, the Grant River. Um, boy, I don't know. Um, I mean, the, that whole Grant River system, if somebody wants to explore that, 
there's a lot of access on it that people who look at it just drive by it and not even be aware of it. Uh, if anybody wants, I mean, I can send whatever, whatever information I got, even photocopies of, of the stuff from from this book that I've got that'll, you know, and it shows where the streams are, the names of the streams, and it actually gives the GPS coordinates to it. I, you know, uh, Jerry's got my phone or address and all that information. Otherwise, uh, I'm not very good with emails. Um, and I, I'm not afraid to give up my phone number. Anybody wants to, you know, and I love saving people time. You know, we'll get weather up here. And sometimes it's one side of the ridge. Sometimes it's the other side of the ridge. And that's the beauty of living here. I know how much rain we get. And you guys can watch the radar down there and say, God, I want to go up there. But am I going to spend three and a half hours driving up here and then go try to go look for water? That's not any fun. Uh, so if anybody wants, I mean, can I get my phone number, Jerry? Is that okay? Yeah. Sure. Okay. It's area code 608 8 two two three zero zero five that's not a cell phone all i have is a landline so i uh, if you ever think about coming up here just you know let me know who you are uh a lot of times uh guys folks will call me just for general information and then get into okay which flies you're using and stuff like that it's like well you know are you gonna hire me and, well, no, we just want all this information, but we're going to go up to the Brooklyn area. And it's like, you know what? The fishing is much better up there anyhow. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, I've been selfish about this area for years. I've written articles in magazines over the years, <laughs> newspapers and stuff like that. And I've been very selfish. You know, to me, I'm old school. I like going out and having the screen to myself. And uh, I don't mind sharing it with people when I'm guiding. And, and the deal with guiding is I have to take it to a different level. First of all, I have to take on, do it. Are there any disabilities that I need to know about? You know, that's important for me. I'm first class or um, first aid. I take that almost every year. Uh, CPR, I'm good on that. And I have to take into consideration the ability of the fishermen that I'm taking. Uh, I've had folks that, uh, well, you know, we're going to get up there tonight. Uh, we want to be on the morning. Uh, what time would you suggest being on the water in the morning? And it's like, well, I'd like to be on the water by 6.30 in the morning. 6.30 in the morning, you know, okay. is that am right and I said yeah well why do you want to be on so early and I said well you know you've got a 70 year old man that just had his hip replaced uh unstable on areas I have to think about where I can take you that's going to be safe enough for you to fish and you know I have to think about the liabilities and things like that well, when you say that, you know, well, nine o'clock wouldn't be too bad. Well, by nine o'clock, you go out and you drive around and there's a lot of people out in those easy places because there's other people with disabilities that plan ahead. So now I've got to go to plan B. Well, now I'm going to take secondary water. But that's the nice thing about all the secondary water because everybody else is on the primaries. Think about a trip to Montana. Where do you go? I'm going to go to, well, let's see. I want to go to the Big Horn. I want to do, you know, Yellowstone. I want to do this and that. Well, guess what? Everybody else goes there too. You know, go to go to Michigan. Well, where's everybody go? Well, let's go to the Manatee. Let's go to the, the tour. Well, everybody else is going there too. And there's so many, so much other water that, Go out and explore it, have fun. You know, if you lose a fly or two, 
oh well. But you know what? At least, at least you gain a secondary place to possibly go and fish if, oh well, somebody's fishing your water already. Jim, I have a question. Sure. Uh, I'd like to ask. I've observed over the years that, and, and maybe you've seen this too or not, and that's why I'm asking. On the big green, do the fish during the summertime move upstream, some of the bigger fish, up into the very upper parts of it? My experience, no. Uh, what they will do, because the green is very, very rich with springs, they don't need to migrate that far. Uh, I, I haven't caught that many big fish about Spring Valley Road. Every once in a while, one will migrate up and, and you know, everybody knows about, you know, there's a tree 200 yards upstream at the bend. It's a big pool. Everybody hits it. And yes, there's always a big fish in there. You know, the deal is, and I love it because it's a slot limit that he'll live there perpetually until he dies. But if, and the DNR always plants at bridges. And yeah. so, you know, and the bridges are always deep holes, but the deal is they don't need to migrate. There's so many springs on the Big Green River that they will pool up at best uh, during the summer months, deep water, they don't need a whole lot of oxygen. They're normally a riffle up above. So they do get oxygen down to them plus food. And during the summer, they become very cannibalistic. Uh, I've seen a lot of times where uh, a 20 inch fish will have a six inch brown trout, you know, halfway devoured. And it's like, well, how can you swim like that? But uh, no, they don't migrate to my knowledge. <laughs> Good. Other questions, please. Hey, Jim. Uh, Jim. When you're fishing caddis patterns, is there a particular color that you like to use? Is it olive? Is it tan? Is it, you know, whatever? Uh, I fish olive as far as the body, and it's all rabbit. And, and I use uh, uh, the typical gray brown from rabbit and uh, the deal with the caddis and mine are very simplistic um, geez, if I can I don't know if you probably can't see this but anyhow I, I was highlighted in fly Trader magazine at one time and uh, caddis is uh, they don't really key on the color. I don't think of the body. Uh, wings, wing, they do. Uh, sometimes uh, if, if your wing is too light colored, as far as deer hair, uh, they'll reject it. Uh, most often it'll be a medium brown. And the deal, you know, just match size and color with what's out there. I mean, you'll see when caddis is arising. But, uh, you know, I would have an, a, an assortment of brown and olive bodied, but also have an assortment or the two wing assortment of either lighter or darker. Outside of that, it's pretty much size. And like I said, with caddises, the only wrong way to fish them is to dead, dead you know, uh, do a dead drift. Uh, and I was telling Jerry or, or, um, earlier or on one of our last conversations, and Mag knows this about me also, when I'm fishing caddises, I offset my hook point by five or 10 degrees. Uh, <laughs> I did, well, there's a reason. Well, isn't that true, Meg? Yes. <laughs> and, and it's a proven fact because a lot of times when I'm fishing caddises, I will cast it, I will start out upstream because, you know, upstream, those fish haven't seen you yet. And what I'll do is I'll cast it upstream and I'll high stick them coming back. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
if there's no wind, that way I can control that that caddis all the way through the drift. And by high sticking it, I don't have to strip in my line. And, and as the fly is you know, proceeding downstream, I can just do a little roll cast with the line that I've got and keep it going downstream. Well, when it hits the end of its swing and it's swinging over and it's gonna come straight downstream from me. And the deal is, I never follow that fly with my fly rod. I keep my fly rod perpendicular to it. And the reason being that if I follow that and I've got a tight line and a fish comes up and takes, a lot of times that 5X tippet, you will take, it'll break off on the take. So if you have your rod perpendicular on the swing, not only does it keep it out in the stream further, but it also when that fish comes up and hits it, the rod is also like a shock absorber. It'll absorb a lot of that shock that if you were straight lining to that fly leading it, you know, following it straight downstream, there's not enough stress in that pit on 5X to absorb it, so it'll break off. So if you let your fly rod do your shock absorber, you know, let that fish hit. And when that fish does hit, uh, when it's downstream, and, and if you've got that offset hook point by five or 10 degrees, it's not gonna mess up the integrity of the hook. You can do it as it's sitting in the vise. If it's gonna break, that's where I want it to break. <clears throat> and I, I've never had a hook point break. The only time that I did was when I started I used to use uh, Orvis hooks, or I'm sorry, partridge hooks for my dry fly hooks. I don't use them anymore. They're way too brittle as far as trying to do the offset hook. What I tie mine all on are scud hooks. And the deal with offsetting the hook point on a scud hook, because on a scud, when you build a body onto that scud hook, it closes the gap. Offset at that five degrees, and it opens that gap up again. So no matter how that fish hits that fly, I mean, if it's a fish's mouth is flat and here's your fly, and if it bites it on its side, there's nothing to, to bite onto it. If you've got that offset hook point, no matter how it bites, it's gonna get bit in the top or bottom lip. And when you, do, when, when you do the hook set at the end of the swing, don't just pick it up and recast it. A lot of the fish uh, during caddises will follow, follow, follow. And, you know, a lot of, sometimes they'll just, you know, swim away from it. The change of direction at the end of the swing, I always just dabble, dabble. And a lot of times that's when the fish will take. On your hook set, don't do a sweep set, do a straight up air. Because what's gonna happen, that fish is gonna come up, he's gonna eat it, and he's gonna turn. If you sweep set, it's gonna pull it away from it. And it, if you do the upset or straight up, you're gonna catch him. Just a little insider information from me. I, a few of you have fished with me. Uh, I mean, I like the idea of catching fish. I love catching fish. The deal is any more guiding. I don't get to fish that much anymore. Uh, I've had a couple of auctions. Uh, well, I mean, last year I donated my 206 trips to a different organization. I know you guys have gotten, I don't know, five or six over the years, but uh and I, and I love helping out organizations like yours. I mean, you put your money where your mouth is and, and you take care of business. And I like that about clubs. But, okay, well, I'm starting to ramble, so I better have Jim. a... Jim. Um, yes. Jim. Okay, yes. Jim. Um, tell them about the... Um, which direction to the fish face in the morning versus the afternoon and evening as far as their vision, you were telling me you know, sometimes 
in the morning they're facing, they always face, uh, what is it, away from the sun? Well, so they're gonna be, no. no, that's not quite what you told me, but if you could explain that to everybody, it's very helpful, okay. I thought. Well, the deal with our area here is, uh, earlier I had mentioned to Jerry that this whole county is set up uh, into a quarter. Uh, you've got Highway 61, which is a ridge running east and west. You've got Highway 61 running north and south. In the morning, you have to remember that on that eastern side, that those fish are going to be facing to the west because the water flow is coming from the west. So their vision is much better if they're not looking into the sun versus if you go in that Castle Rock Creek and the Blue River. Well, the Blue River is a different story because that flows from the east to the west. Now, if you go over to the Green River, which flows from the, from the east to the west also, and if you get in all of our rivers, they got oxbows. And if you think about it, and, and if you, you look up and you're looking into the sun, that's exactly what the fish is seeing. So go to the other side of the oxbow, and those fish will be looking away from the sun. And just to kind of play that whole game with the fish, because, you know, I always take it from a, a fish's point of view. It's like, Geez, if I'm looking up and I can't see anything, and I know that their vision is the same unless it's something that's subsurface, you know, if I'm fishing dries or surface wise, I just go around the oxbow, fish the, you know, so that the fish they aren't looking into the sun. And I think it makes a difference. And the deal is, I mean, you can go back in the afternoon and fish the other side of that. <clears throat> Thanks. So I don't know if that was much help or not, Meg, but. No, you were just saying of the fish are facing, that are facing east in the morning. Or the east. No, it depends it on which. It's the opposite, I'm sorry. If they're facing the east, that's when the sun is coming up in the east. Well, you have actually, to, you have to remember. What, well. No, what, it, what I'm saying is depending upon which ridge which side of the ridge you're fishing on. Mm -hmm. uh, Castle Rock Creek runs from the west to the east. So yes. in the morning, that sun's not going to be in their eyes because they're all basically looking upstream so that they can get you know oxygen and uh, water flow. And then if you go to the, you know, if you're on the Green River in the morning, uh, the sun is coming up in the east, and that water runs from the east to the west. So those fish are basically looking into the sun. Uh, now, if it, and like I said, we're blessed with a lot of oxbows in that. So you know, if, if you're, I mean, a lot of these sections are just straight sections that uh, you know those fish are all looking into the sun. You know just go to another location, maybe downstream, upstream, and go there. Sorry, I said it so poorly. You say it much better. You know, I, your point was too, if fish don't have eyelids, so there's no protection from the sun. So when they're looking toward the sun, they can't see a doggone thing. Now, right. I asked you about what if the stream is running north-south, it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't think it. I don't think. Well, the deal is, it, it, they either. Yeah, I mean, everything on the. If you took this in quartered off Grant County, if you took uh, north and east of of Fenimore, which is uh, going to be your Blue River, uh, and Castle Rock, and Doc Smith, that's all going to flow into the Wisconsin River. Uh, now, if you go to the other side of the ridge, uh, where the Big Green River is and Crooked Creek, that's all going to flow into the Wisconsin River. Now, if you jump over the ridge uh, south of Highway 61, where you've got the Platte River and the Grant River, that flows into the Mississippi. So, it, you know, it's uh, a lot of different 
directions going on as far as our streams. But yeah, I mean, my philosophy is fish don't have eyelids. So, you know, and, and so they or sunglasses or anything else. Uh, you know, my big thing is I love ripples. You know me. <laughs> but, uh, and, you know, at least in ripples, the light is broken up and it's not a straight stream. So I don't know. I, if I had all those answers, I'd probably be writing books or something. Well, Jimmy, we're talking about fishing the ripples by keeping the rod pointed at the opposite bank, letting it swing. But also um, your point was that caddis move very haphazardly. So by twitching the rod and then bringing it up and letting it flow down is yep. um, that usually entices the fish quite a bit. So I well, use that on a, I was showing someone using a nymph and the fish took the nymph. <laughs> it was so funny because I was using the same technique and uh, just to show somebody the technique and up came a nice little trout. So, um, okay. But the, yeah, we're talking about the caddis, obviously, like that skittering motion or the. Um, yeah. I started well, it, watching caddis more closely and I'm like, oh, yeah, they're all over the place when they move <laughs> or when they're hatching, they're trying to, you know, get out of the um, case casing. So, the shuck. Okay, I'll shut up now. Yeah, well, cat, cat season is my favorite time of the season, especially, you know, as far as uh, new people to the sport, because it builds their confidence. Everything is visual in front of their eyes. And, and you know, it's, it's exciting for me to have people catch fish. I mean, and the best part about it is when they catch fish, I, I learn where the fish are. For, you know, the next time that I go. So, yeah, there's a two prong of, at, part of being a guide that's also fun. Uh, because, I mean, you can learn through other people's trial and errors. Uh, there's some sections uh, on, on the Rogers branch that I never thought that there would have been a fish on the guy, you know, client that I had says, you know, I heard that they, they did did some work project on this area or something like that. I'd really like to go in there. And I said, well, okay. Well, you know, I hadn't been in there for several years. So it was a whole new experience for me. Went in there and it's like, holy cow. I mean, I couldn't believe all the fish that were in there. It's like, okay, learn something new. So yeah, it's mm. the nice thing about it is, you know, and I, I would go out and explore the area. I mean, it, there's so much fishing out there uh, that, you know, people don't go and see and do, you know, and, and everybody seems to be concentrated on the well-known places. And that's okay. But, you know, for, for me, you know, I, I like going out to areas that I haven't been to in five years because everything changes. Uh, it doesn't matter. I mean, you talked about some of the projects that you were working on and putting your money into um, up in the Viroqua area. And you, you, know, you see how the streams change, uh, whether they're project areas or not. And uh, so you can never go back to the same stream twice. Even the next day, it's not gonna be the same. Jim, could you label, uh, tell us about your five favorite flies and what sizes? We should use for the driftless? My five favorite flies. Uh, of course, uh, the caddis. Uh, and I don't hackle my caddis. Uh, mine are just uh, one of them is, uh, and I borrowed it from Bob Bloomerick, and it's a two minute caddis. Uh, and all it is is deer hair and thread and a hook. Uh, and I'll tie that in a size 16 typically. Uh, the other one is my K, K caddis, which is an emerger pattern, which it doesn't have the bullet head. Uh, and it's tied on a scud hook as well. And what I'll do is I'll wrap it off. I'll pull it up and, and cut a taper on the head. Um, what I can do is I can, you know, anybody that wants a copy of this, and it, it gives the 
tang directions and or uh, whatever's in in the fly i i will send you a copy of it and it shows the patterns that i use for the area uh the other one is a black caddis and as i mentioned earlier i'll tie that in probably size 20 18 and 20 but i will also tie it in a size of 14 just to imitate crickets you know what the heck if i got it if i'm tying i might as well use it i mean it's an impressionistic pattern it does it's not exact but you know what if you fish it like a cricket it'll work uh streamers uh and there's a time for streamers but i also like the time for for blue winged olives uh blue winged olives can be very seasonal i mean uh, You'll see a lot of them in the spring and usually when it's raining. You know, it's all of a sudden, I don't know if it's some water temperature Over yeah. that brings them on, but they can be very exacting. And those are size 16s. Uh, and I'll use a, a lighter and a, doubt, a darker color done wing on them because uh, they can vary that much for us. Uh, and then my little two by out midge. Uh, and I tie that in a size 20. All it is is, um, and I tie it in black, olive, and yellow. Uh, and all it is is two by outs fold over a little spun, uh, little spun dubbing. That's it. And I use that as a dropper. And, and in the spring of the, or summer of the year, the official key on that, and a lot of times they'll take that as a blue winged olive, as a nymph. Uh, some of the biggest fish that I've ever caught have been on that particular fly. Uh, streamer wise, uh, I, I like a bead head. Uh, John Beth, uh, a friend of mine from the Reedsburg area, absolutely loves fishing streamers. Uh, and his are with a bead head or a cone head, probably size 14. They aren't that big a fly, but you don't need that big a hook because uh, how you're tying it, uh, everything projects beyond it and it's all image. But they're typically tied in, a, in an olive and a brown. Body and, and uh, not hackle, but does. Uh, Feather stem. And a lot of times he'll add a little glitter to it just to bring out some personality to it. But uh, if I could get an exact copy of his, boy, I'd send it to everybody, even Gary Borger, because I'm, I'm sure Gary Borger gets them from John. <laughs> But otherwise, yeah, I, 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 pretty much caddises, midges, uh, nymphs are a big thing. Uh, a lot of people don't fish enough nymphs as far as I'm concerned. And I was always known as a nymph fisherman. I love it because, I mean, fish eat nymphs more than they eat mature insects. I mean, they're available all the time. I don't have a, a favorite scud pattern, although I do fish them. Uh, Another good pattern is like La Fontaine's uh, Caddisy Merger, where it's, it's got the, the wing or the case to it, where it's uh, veiled, I guess you might call it. That's been very, very good, even when the caddises aren't hatching, just because it looks like so many different things. You know, it's an impressionistic fly, but then again, that's what they like. What size in that um, La Fontaine? Oh, in the La Fontaine? Uh, probably size 14, 16. They aren't that big. Okay. But then again, you're, you're imitating a caddis. So in caddises, aren't that big anyhow. Yeah, and without the wing, I mean, that's you're fishing basically a body size. What color, Jim? 
Uh, olive and brown. I mean, that's the body and that's the caddises that I've observed here. Uh, and the deal with them is a lot of times you don't have to be that exact because in caddises, you're always fishing moving water. And in reality, fish don't have that much time to look at them. I mean, if they're gonna key on something, they're gonna key on something that looks like it's an easy dinner. And, uh, you know, years ago when I was growing up, you know, our family was, uh, you know, if you're going to go hunting or fishing, you didn't go hunt and release or you don't go fishing and releasing. <laughs> so, you know, we did, uh, you know, bring them home and I did the old thing. It's like, well, let's see what they were eating. And it's incredible the amount of debris that you would find in a fish's stomach. Everything from rocks or little pebbles just sticks that, you know, maybe a, a, a damsel fly was on or something like that. It just ate the whole darn stick. It's amazing what you'd find in their fish, in, in their stomach. I mean, you got to figure, you know, when they're picking uh, caddises or little mayfly nymphs off the gravel, I mean, inadvertently, they're going to suck in, you know, possibly some debris. Uh, some of the grasses or, you know, uh, vegetation. And I've seen that in there also. And I've seen fish swim through vegetation, trying to eat insects. And, you know, they come out, you know, with a mouthful of food or a mouthful of grasses. And it's like, well, you know, they'll digest it. It's, you know, there's food in there someplace, I'm sure. But, uh, okay. All right. Any more questions for Jim? Hey, Jim, Jerry, I, have a I put his phone number on his website in the chat in case anybody wanted it. Yeah, we'll do that. We'll get that out. And also, Mark, uh, you may say, Jim, a lot of trouble if, uh, you know, you showed me that website for the DNR that has all the access maps. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we'll get that up. It, it's the same thing as you have, Jim, but it's on uh, online so they can look it up. Oh, and wonderful. it has all the access, uh, Mark. It's a really Wisconsin, good Wisconsin. It's a Wisconsin DNR map. DNRmaps.wi.gov. Uh, Say that again. DNRmaps.wi.gov. Uh, look for, it's a it's it's for trout trout regulations and opportunities user tool nice okay it got every stream on there most most all of the easements tells you about the stream itself uh the regulations you go on there and go down to the left and hit layers it has trout habitat projects uh Click on the box that says trout water and away you go. We'll post it. We'll get it posted. Yeah. Um, so everybody can have that. So yeah. you can get into it. Because I, I found it very complete and very interesting when Mark showed it to me. I'd never been there before. Um, so next month, uh, looks like we're going to have a gentleman from uh, Arkansas and uh, he would be talking about uh, one of two things, White River uh, 101, telling us about the White River, um, and or he can talk about, uh, his name is Steve Daly, by the way, I couldn't remember, uh, talk about uh, brown trout, their habitat, their, their piscatorial challenges, and how to fish them, uh, so we can apply that anywhere and uh it's something to think about we may do a little poll uh, but if you uh if anybody has a preference email me let me know and then we'll uh we'll kind of get a feel for which one what he wants to talk about so he'll be there next next uh february the 18th is the next meeting so we'll have him and then on the march meeting um we're going to have 
uh, Tim Flager. And uh, he's going to talk about uh, fish food and how to imitate it with flies and how to fish them. We've got two good lineup coming up in a row. Uh, just remember, get out there and get those um, prizes raffled off for us, please. Visit the website and uh, put your money down and we'll be glad to take it because we are certainly going to need it this year and we need to uh, get get some money in for the chapter. So, uh, Jerry, you might tell them where we got the prizes too. Pardon me, Jerry? You might acknowledge where we got from John uh, wife, Diane, who donated an awful lot of these prizes. Yes, John Mason passed away seven years ago and his wife passed all these things on to us. Um, the other thing is, along with it that she passed off, uh, and I told this to the fly tires, but I'd like to acknowledge it to everybody else. There's a whole fly tying kit that is a travel kit that is chock full of everything you'll ever need to tie flies for a long time. You won't buy anything for a long, long time. It's got a Renzetti travel vice in it. It's just top notch. And uh, we're, we're asking, uh, we're offering that for $500 for a bid uh, straight out. And we're going to later on put it in on our uh, sales uh, uh, auction when we do one, but uh, I'd like to see this go to somebody in the chapter if they're interested. So uh, I know it, it sounds like a lot, but if you see what's in here, it's a royal bargain. It really it is. It is a big bag too. It, we're not I'll, talking I'll, about- I'll call, around the corner. I'll call you back when I'm done. <laughs> it's a lifetime supply of every- Okay, yeah. bye. It's this is this. a very, a very big bag. Yeah, look it's at the size bag. of it. It's got, it's got everything, beads, beads. hooks, tackle, <laughs> wire, everything. thread. So interested, drop me an email. You can come see it. Uh, I'd be glad to show it to you. And uh, it's it's worth the, the money for sure. Well, so, at this, hey, Jerry, if yes, I could, that? if I could, could I donate a day's guided trip? You sure could. Sure. Oh, that'd be great, Jim. Thank you. Okay. Well, ho hopefully I'll be able to do whole days this year. I don't know. I've, I've got another procedure. I've got to go in on Monday and do another surgery. Uh, well, good luck so, on that. Well, yeah. thank you. It, good luck. It, I, and we'll, be, we'll be doing these raffles and, and, and um, auctions probably through the end of um, May uh, and maybe more. So there'll be plenty of time for you to decide if you're ready to do it, Jim. So okay. Um, that was thank not you for that offer out there. Yeah, we'll leave it go. Thank for you very while. much for the offer too. Oh, you're welcome. Yes, yes thank, thank you. Jim. Thank you for being such a, a wonderful speaker tonight. I know I enjoyed it. I hope everybody else has learned a heck of a lot. And very interesting. Uh, I'd like to hear a round of applause here for you. Thank you. Oh. Oh, thank you so much. I'm, I'm hard to hear that when everybody muted when you could do it. <laughs> well, all right. I'm flattered and humbled, and go. thank you. I'm flattered. How's Sophie doing? Hey, Jim, how's Sophie doing? Sophie's doing good. We, uh, we had to get her a babysitter for this coming weekend because, uh, like I said, uh, they had that arterial transplant on me this last summer. And uh, I had a test yesterday, and there seems to be a little blockage in it. So they're going to do the rotor rooter thing, I guess. Uh, I don't know what the technical term is, but anyhow, uh, see if they can open it up a little bit more. But it sounds pretty minor. So it sounds like I'll be in for a, a couple of days. But, it, but anyhow, we got her babysitter, and she's, oh, hell, Sophie doesn't care as long as there's food. <laughs> Sophie is a Welsh corgi. She's cute. Oh, tell, uh, and Barb, tell Barb to say hi. I will. Where's Barb? Hey, and, oh, she's uh, in the other room watching some webcam. I don't know what she's doing. 
Okay. Uh, probably some photography again. Yeah, she's okay. been very um, she's been very busy with her photography. All right. Uh, One other thing, Dennis. Uh, are you there, Dennis Sullivan? I'm I'm here, Jerry. Oh yes, I'm, the I'm uh, net here. came today, and how did, how uh, you were wrong when I said this. The net came and it's in good shape, and good. I've got a, a lot of elk care for the fly tires. And yeah, thank Bob. you. It's really good. I, I'm probably going to need a hacksaw to cut it up. I think, but it's well. I I'm not into tan. My, myself and my taxidermist aren't into the tanning end, but he he was very uh, amiable to release it to me. So. Uh, I figured that the the chapter could use it. You know, it's it's just as easy to pick off a, a hard hide as is a soft one. Oh yeah, it, it, but it's nice hair. It's really yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah, it's good hair. Yeah, it's, for you, it's always a good price. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it's about about a quarter of an elk hide. Wow! Oh, wow! <laughs> yeah, it's it's a big box, folks. <laughs> yeah, it's, there's there's, there's a bit of hair. afraid to yell. I need yeah. some elk hair. Even you, Jerry Ward, you can use some of that. Well, I thank you, sir. You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks a bunch. I'll get Jim some, yeah, for sure. All right, let's wrap it up. If there's no other questions and thoughts, I hope you enjoyed it. I know I did. John Bacon, good night. Get to bed. You're up late. Yeah. Nice. Take Thanks care. Again, Stay Jim. Safe. Good night, okay. John. Thank you so much for for inviting me into your fold again, and I uh, look forward to seeing some of you fishing this year. You will. Thank you. You bet. Yeah, we'll be there we'll sooner there. or later. Thank you. Okay. Like I said, the offer is always there. If some if you need information as far as streams, absolutely give me a call, and I'll let you know what I know. Know what I know. Yeah. Thank Sometimes you. Sir. Say, are they clear or are they muddy? <laughs> oh, they're absolutely gin clear right now. <laughs> oh, they are. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, good night, all. Good night. Take, Take care. care. Right. Good night. Are you ready? Take us out, and we'll get off of here.